Hello and welcome to Film Lovers. I'm Sonia Chung. I'll be talking to people who work in the film industry and who are also avid film lovers. Today I'll be talking to colorist Heinz Donnelly Schmidt. How are you, Heinz? I'm fine. Hi, Sonia. Good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so first of all, should we explain how we found each other? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I, uh, I'm a, I'm a avid user of Facebook and uh, I browse many different groups um, because as a colorist working in post-production, you never know where your next uh, coloring job is going to come from or who in the production chain is going to put you in touch with the people who actually hire the colorists. Um, so I saw your call out on a actors group. I can't remember the name, which one, but, um, a couple of them. uh, and sorry, there's a couple of them, aren't there? Yeah, there's a couple of them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I responded to the, um, the call out on there. Yeah. I, I'm pretty desperate for people. <laughs> so I posted on a couple of them and um, a few of the film groups on Facebook as well, just saying I'm struggling to find people to talk to. Um, so, yeah, it's quite like we were saying before recording, um, there's a lot of people that don't bother to read the reply, <laughs> to read your message <laughs> on those actor groups. Yeah. Um, so, so. I mean, I only picked out a few of them, you know, the ones that could really, like you, who could really be bothered to say anything and, you know, yeah. just go into a bit more explanation about what they do, et cetera, which is really nice. Um, and also I can tell they're more genuine that way as well and they, they have more passion for it. So yeah. um, so usually what we do is, what I do is when I talk to someone for the first time, um, it's basically more about their background and their career. And then if they ever want to come back, like I told you before we started recording, then they're always welcome to come back anytime and talk about, um, we do a theme show of their choice. So it can be absolutely anything as long as it's film related. So, yeah. so if you ever want to, that's fine. <laughs> I might um, actually do because uh, as a colorist, we're normally locked away in a, in yeah. a dark base, basement, you know, working for months and months and then, um, you see the fruit of our labor, but you never really see the color. Yeah, I it's think. kind of it's kind of like probably um if you think about the analogy of having a band, you always see, you know, the the the, the vocalist and the guitarist and the bassist and the poor guy at the back of the drums. Nobody really notices yeah. <laughs> him. But you know, um, yeah. you know, what you do is very important and people don't seem to realize that. So I think the best way to start is just um just go back to how you started well where are you from how you started how you got interested in what you were doing and yeah basically like there so just how you developed yeah, sure. the film etc and then how you decided to go into doing what you finally do now so it's basically like um like a little um timeline I guess of your career all right I'll uh, I'll try and not keep you too long um <laughs> <laughs> I was born in South Africa near Johannesburg and um Grew up with an interest in photography from a very young age. Um, back then it was film, um, showing my age, but everything was film. There was no such thing as digital. The internet didn't exist. And um, I think we had television from about six in the evening for an hour. And that was it. So <laughs> you had to keep yourself busy in other ways. And um, I came to England or came to the UK in 2004. And um, immediately took up photography again because of the, just the scenery and it's you know it looks very different. England looks extremely. Um, you, you've got these historical buildings and it, it's ex an extremely photographic country. Mm. Uh, so I picked up the photography again, and um, my actual day job is in IT, okay. um, but. The photography moved from a hobby into something that was a little bit more of a part-time business. Um, and I, at first, did weddings and portraits and um, started to sell myself as a wedding and portrait photographer. And that sort of morphed into fashion. Um, and I was a fashion photographer for quite a while and um, got quite successful. I worked for... 
uh, Tony and Guy and Unilever, big companies. Um, I did the photography for their product pack product okay, packaging, specifically like hair dryers and, and straighteners. When you go into the shop and they've got these boxes with the pretty girl on the front, um, that's the kind of thing I shot. Sure. And as part of that job was also uh, retouching, uh, skin retouching and, and making people look the way that they don't really look in <laughs> real life. <laughs> and um, so uh, that fizzled out a little bit when life took over with um, kids and everything else. Um, but I, I never I never lost the interest. Um, uh, in the, it's been a lifelong hobby. But I've always loved movies. I've always loved cinema and film. Um, and I thought, well, I've got some time on my hands. I've got camera gear and everything else. Um, let's go into videography. So I, I, I spent some time as a videographer. I wouldn't say a, a, a DP because I never worked on film sets. Um, I worked on film sets as a stills photographer. Mm -hmm. You know, those photographers that sort of take stills on set to show the behind the scenes or whatever. Yeah. Um, and um, and from there, I fell into color grading. I, did, I don't even know how it happened, to be mm. quite honest. I think somebody, I think it was a friend of mine that gave me their film and said, I'm struggling to make this look like a Hollywood film. What do I need to do? Um, and I, I researched it, and from then on, I just completely fell in love with some, uh, with color grading, because it essentially takes a you know a, a video that was shot that looks like a video anybody shoots on a weekend, and it turns it into something that looks like a film that's shot you know, in Hollywood. Um, what, it really I has the power to transform a film. Okay, I was going to say. Um... Because I'm sure a lot of people don't. I mean, it sounds simple, but what does it exactly do? So, um, does it make the colors more vibrant, for instance? Um, so there's there's really hard. three stages to it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so the first stage uh, would be what you call color correction. So that would be taking, um, if you take a, a, a film production that was shot over days or weeks or months. Um, Films normally are broken up into scenes, and you would have, um, let's say there was a scene that was outdoors, shot outdoors, and um, in the story, that scene takes place in the evening. Um, and throughout this whole scene, there's quite a few shots, um, and they all have to look consistent. It also, uh, all has to look like it you know, played off in the evening. Um, because that's how it happens in the script, and how it happens yeah. in the story. But in productions, um, you, you don't actually film in the order that the script is written. Um, so it's it's filmed out of sequence. So sometimes the, you've got shots that are supposed to be in the evening, but they were shot early in the day because of production schedule. Sure. Um, so that, that that's one example. The other example is just whenever there was a problem with uh, exposure where, where the um, the footage was captured too too bright um, and it doesn't fit in with the rest of the scene so um, that correction would essentially take the all of the clips or all of the shots across the whole movie and just balance it so it all looks consistent mm. Um, so the correction would be the first step. The second step would be uh, what we call matching. So if you take um, all of the shots that happen in a scene, let's say this time it was early morning in somebody's front room, that sunlight coming in through the window um, would have a specific color, a specific tone. So then we would take that entire scene and we would match it so it looks like it happened in the same in terms of the color tone not so much the brights or darks or exposure okay and then the third part of it is to apply a look um and this is probably the more exciting part of it the, the, okay. the, 
a bit that people will will recognize. Why is it um, exciting? <laughs> and it, it, because you can take, um, if you think about films like The Matrix, it's got a very specific tone. Um, and they had the difference where whenever they were in The Matrix, it had that greenish tone to it. Sure, but whenever yeah. they were on, you know, in the, in the real world on the yeah, yeah. um it looked completely different. So mm. it's the the colors actually applies that look that that um, uh, that's a visual thing. So it's really hard to explain in words. Yeah. No, I understand <laughs> but, um, what you mean. Um, it's funny yeah. because I would have thought that that uh, that a lot of that was also done on set with color filters as well. So I guess it's a bit of both, really, isn't it? Um, I think in the days of film, that used to be the case, um, okay. where there wasn't as much post production. They did have um, colorists working on on films in the film days. Um, they were called color timers, okay. um, and yes, they still do do quite a bit of that on set, um, but for bigger productions. So on a bigger production, you would get the colorist in. Uh, during pre-production and you would plan the look of the film and create a mood board for the film and then um, the colorist could actually come to set and create what's called a show lot. Um, show lot is, is, is just something that you apply to the director's monitor and it actually puts a look onto what he sees on the monitor while they're filming it. Oh, and that look is the look that they want for the film yeah, or yeah, it's yeah. You know, let's say it's 70 percent there um so there's there's a lot of work that a colors can do during pre-production and on set um but in general with smaller budgets there isn't a budget for it so it doesn't happen we only we only see the film the first time when um it's gone through uh picture lock mm. where the editor has decided or oh, the, the, the in the editing suite, they've decided that the edit is finished. That's when they then send it to the colorist. Oh, okay. So it's always the uh, it's always the editor that does his thing first or her thing. First, yes. And then they pass it yeah. on to you to right. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. I I only um, accept uh, films when they are in picture lock because if you have. Um, when I grade the footage, if it goes back to edit and they make changes to it, then they're essentially going to introduce ungraded footage onto a graded film, which makes no sense. Um, yeah. Or, or they'd have to send it to me and grade, you know, again on, on top of it. So, um, yeah, it, it essentially needs to be in picture lock before it comes to the colorist. How many of you usually are involved? Does it vary on the... The budget. So, for instance, if it's a big feature film, would, uh, would there maybe be more than one of you? Yeah, uh, there would be. So, on a big feature film, you would have um, uh, many different people working in the um, in the post production colorist okay. department. Uh, you would have a dailies colorist. So, um, that is a colorist that works on the footage that's been shot. As it as it's shot every day, as part of the daily colorist, and they do a range of um, uh, jobs on it, uh, conforming it, which basically means just converting it from one um, type of footage to another, which just takes a long time. Yeah. Um, they could apply an intermediate look so that the director can just check and see if what they've shot actually looks like it should. Um, there's uh, your digital intermediate colorists, um, which, to my understanding, uh, a digital intermediate is used when a, f a, a larger production is filmed on film. Okay. That film is then developed, scanned, sent to the digital intermediate colorist, which will, which will then color grade the footage. Um, and then from there on, it'll pass through the rest of the production pipeline. Okay. Um, so on on large body production, on large productions, you would have more than one colorist. And on smaller productions, it would just be a colorist. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um. So because you mentioned earlier that in the old days, obviously they didn't have the luxury of having, um, you know, what the technology that they do now. Yeah. So so 
how would they use the color timer that you mentioned earlier? What would that person do uh, in that era of filmmaking, you know, before all of this well, technology started? Do you know roughly? This th this might be, th this might get a little bit technical now. Okay. But, um, <laughs> so, so back then they would have developed the negative um, and then they would then project the negative onto a film positive. And that film positive is then the um, piece of film that's going to be projected in cinema. But during the projection um, from the negative to the positive, mm. the color timer can actually introduce um, uh, essentially like colored filters, red, green, and blue colored filters. Oh, okay, that's interesting. So they basically slide that in front of the in front of the projector that's going from the negative to the right. positive, and they can use the color timer system um, to add or subtract red or green and blue. Now, red, green, and blue um, colors. The opposite of red is cyan. The opposite of green is magenta, and the opposite of yellow of blue is yellow okay. so by moving those you're actually introducing those different color tones so you can you can make quite a lot of um it, there's quite a big change that you can make to the look of a film just with mm. those three controls and we still have those controls in our digital equivalents um do, you still, you, do, do they still use them from time to time then maybe well they called so they called something else within our software. It's not called color timing anymore. Okay. Um, but we still have those controls within um, and and still use. I still use. Um, yeah. The uh, uh, controls. It's uh, within the software I use. It's called the RGB mixer. Okay. But um, still a very useful tool for for balancing the colors within a shot. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because um, because you also um or into photography, et cetera. So I was going to ask a couple of questions, mention a few things about that as well. So um, yeah, sure. so I guess when you started, it was before the, dig the digital stuff came in. Um, yeah. And we we had a family friend, uh, or friends actually, they they ran their own picture library. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people did, which was the, the old fashioned way where they had the, you know, the photos everywhere and then they sent them yeah. off to the newspapers if the papers needed a specific look or um, photo of some kind. Um, yeah. So they had basically a library. Everything was stacked away and that's how it worked. Uh, and also it was uh, when I studied, um, did my BTEC media studies, the second year we did photography, it was all darkroom stuff. Um, did you use the darkroom as well? Did you ever have to um, do, do any stuff? I, I did, I did, and yeah. I, I still do. Um, I, I still have film cameras. Um, probably can't see that. Yeah. Um, I still have film cameras that I use oh, from time wow, to time, okay. and I just develop the film in my kitchen these days. It's all black and white. Um, yeah, yeah. I've done I've done color, but it's yeah. it's a little bit more tricky with temperatures um, and stuff. Because some photographers, I think, like to use the old way more still, even though they can do all this in your you know the computers and stuff. I think some try to stick yeah. much to the original way. Um, my friend, uh, who's also a photographer, he'll listen to this. He's like you. He also um, he studied photography, and then he went into fashion photography. So yeah. um, and he still practices a lot as a hobby. Um, even though he's not working as one professionally anymore. Um, but he said that he always tries to stick to doing as much of the stuff that he learned from the beginning. Um, but yeah. then obviously he edits everything on his computer now with all these uh, photoshops. But then it's quite sad in a way, I think, because um, not for him, I mean, because he's a great photographer. But now there's a lot of people that think that actually to, uh, they can manipulate the image too much on the computer. And it's kind of taken the art away from being a genuinely good photography and having a good eye for it, if that makes sense, which I think it's quite, um, there's not many people that can do that now is what I'm trying to say. Does yeah, that make sense? Um, it does make sense. And um, I think my, my respect for the film days and how things were, were done back then um, has translated into my color grading because um, 
even though I see photography and 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 um, color grading in video m more like painting than a technical thing. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when, when people say you shouldn't manip manipulate an image too much, they're basically saying you should try and keep the image as it would have been if we'd shot it on film and we didn't exactly. have the tools yeah, to yeah, change yeah. it. Yeah, exactly yeah. what I mean. Yeah. Um, and um, I, I, I'm not sure that that is, uh, is still required. Um, yeah. If you look at at the art that comes out on Instagram. And if you look at art in general, there's the, the, the great thing about art is the freedom. You can create anything you want. Mm. Um, and if other people like it, then that's a bonus. Um, yeah. But uh, there is, in the world of color grading, there's a, a, a very hard push for people or for colorists to make films that we grade that were shot on, on, on digital cameras to make it look like the old film. Um, yeah. films, uh, movies, and um, you see all kinds of uh, uh, what they call LUTs, they like plugins or overlays or whatever we install them filters um, that try and make film uh, like digital movies look like it was shot on film. And um, even within the colorist community, there's a lot of no, you shouldn't do that because. Um, it's it's pushing it too far, or you should rather do this because it would be more um, photometrically accurate. Which mm. essentially means the change that you're making is more in line with the change that you would have made in a camera. Sure. Um, and I think that was very much the thinking um, across the board until a movie came out called Joker. Okay. Have um, you seen? With Joaquin Phoenix? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I haven't seen it. <laughs> I know I know of it. I haven't <laughs> seen it. No, because I've so, heard very I heard I mean he's an amazing actor, but um yeah. I know he plays it as a very disturbing individual. So I will at some point, but I have to be in the right frame of mind. But is there mind, is yeah. there certain yeah. colour to that? I imagine there would be because he's very well, he's a comic book. So Yeah. The, the the Joker that film was so well color graded, but it also broke some of the rules. Oh really? Um, Can you explain you know, all the accepted norms? Um, the, the 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 look on Joker was 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 pushed much further than we were used to before then. Okay. Um, and um, whereas normally you would take. A, uh, a film and whatever's black you would try to keep black and whatever's white you would, you would try to keep white and then you put your color changes in between those two extremes um now on joker the your highlights the, the the brightest highlights are still white and the darkest blacks are still dark but um that envelope of where the the, the color was pushed it changed well, it was so much wider, and the colorist, um, her, her, her name is Jill Bogdanovich. She works for one of the biggest color grading companies in the world called Company 3. Um, she got quite famous for grading Joker because of this just amazing look that was applied to the film. Um, and she's my absolute hero. Um, uh, in terms of the coloring world, you know, sure. if you ask a question, who do you look up to? Well, I was going to say that's a good question. Okay. <laughs> um, and um, so, uh, and when she, when she was interviewed, and this interview struck me. Um, they they asked her about her past, and she says that she uh, she I think she's got a degree in in physics, okay. but she's also a painter. Okay. which is a perfect marriage of technical yeah. and artistic. Yeah. Um, and, and that's very much what you need to be a colorist, or it would be good if you had that if you're a colorist, because so, mo so much of it is extremely technical and so much of it is artistic. And I think sometimes when somebody doesn't have the artistic um, mindset, They'll latch onto the technical and go, no, you shouldn't do that because if you do that, then you're going to break these technical norms or these rules and everything. And they'll be looking at somebody who's maybe more of an artist and they 
um, are not so afraid with the technical side of it, but they're yeah. just creating something that looks good to them. And also, um, I guess they're, they're, they'd be sort of playing it safe in a way, wouldn't they? Rather yeah. than having the, 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 the freedom to sort of break the rules, like you said, if, if yeah. they yeah. want to or if needed be. Um, yeah. So uh, I was going to quickly ask you, because we kind of didn't talk about that. Um, you briefly mentioned before recording that you were, for a short period of time, a filmmaker. So why don't you go into how, how that started and how you, and then you explained that obviously later on you became a colorist. Um, so yeah. why don't you quickly tell us about your short career as a filmmaker and would you also <laughs> ever go back to doing it? Okay, um, would I go back? No. Really? Uh, probably start there because it's just lugging around too much equipment. Um, okay. And uh, <laughs> I think my, my days of uh, photography was as well. Um, my days of lugging equipment around uh, are at an end. Um, <clears throat> a very good example of lugging equipment around on the ph photography side was when at the end of my wedding photography career, um, my high point was um, I shot Gary Lineker's wedding in Italy. Oh, wow. Okay. And I had to um, transport all of the equipment to Italy and back. Um, okay. And it's planes and customs and all kinds of things. So, yes, that, I think that was the first time I thought to myself, this might, might just not be worth it. Or cost effective. <laughs> <But> the, um, <laughs> <laughs> the the wedding was great and marvelous, of course. You know, how could it not be? Um, and um, when I did the videography, uh, I kept it very low key. I didn't make, I, I didn't do short films or features. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you, did you ever go into very doing much, any... No, no, no. Just, it was very much com commercial stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So, uh, so did you ever do commercials as well, or just video, uh, just for weddings, mostly? <laughs> Mostly. Um, I did weddings and I also did um, commercials, which were not commercials in the sense of uh, broadcast television, um, more um, internet commercials for local businesses where it introduces the viewer to the business. It's like something you would put on your, your YouTube channel okay. when you've got a business. Um, uh, but even that, uh, required loads of kit. I mean, it's lighting, it's um, camera support stands. Um, yeah. I didn't really have a, a, a team to assist yeah. with the filming. Uh, so it just it became a bit much. And for the time that I spent on it, uh, because after the, the video was shot, I also edited and then color graded it. And that's probably where I forgot my first taste of color grading okay. before delivering to the client. Um, so the videography thing wasn't that long until um, I decided uh, I actually want to be at the end of the chain at the color grading and okay. not at the beginning of it with the filming. Um, did you have to go into studying it somehow? Because you said that you, you developed your passion for color grading and you wanted to go into it when you were working on um like film sets as a photographer so so did you how did you sort of specialize and train for it specifically did you have to go to a school of any kind or do some no because strangely enough for color grading there there isn't there are no university degrees or courses or anything that you can okay. take for color grading um there are lots of online courses, but the quality varies greatly. Um, I did a few online training courses, um, uh, some of them quite in-depth um, and some of them not so in-depth, but over a, quite a long time period um, where I'd be busy with the course for about six months. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was all self-study. Okay. Um, my background at that stage in photo editing and photo retouching helped a lot because I, I already understood. Yeah, about, I met it with you. Yeah. Yeah. And I you've got the advantage color. of that as well, like you said, because you've come from a, photog from a photography background. So yeah. obviously that's very um, important because that's, you know, so you're going to have generally a knack for it 
as well. And also yeah. you've got more of the artistic side rather than, I guess you kind of did it the other way around, didn't you? Because you did the artistic thing first and then you developed it into the technical thing. The technical, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which in yeah, a way I think I, is better, I think, because like you said, I, you don't get too lost in, in, in thinking, no, you can't do that. You have to do it like that because you're too busy being too technical because that's how you were trained originally. That yeah. you, you mentioned yeah. Earlier, yeah. um, question for you when we had the lockdowns, um, did you get a lot of work coming in? I got a lot of work coming in. It's funny, because... isn't it? Because I spoke to several people that were editors, uh, well, friends who were filmmakers, and all the say they said exactly the same about their friends who editors were bombarded with work <laughs> during the lockdowns. So, um, so My... yeah, why don't you tell us about that? <laughs> Yeah, my lockdown experience was something else. Um, because nobody could film, everybody wanted to edit what they had and then color grade what they had. Okay. So um, my workload quadrupled um, overnight. And um, some of it was uh, short films that were filmed locally. Um, uh, some of it was film color grading jobs coming in from America. Um, there was just so much um, uh, demand for, for for my skills at that time that I started to ask around in the north of England for any other colors that could help. Um, but unfortunately, there are there aren't many um, at, at this moment. I know another one in Sheffield, one in Manchester, one in Leeds, and ah. that's pretty much it. Um, and then I know a guy in, in, in London, but he, he works essentially full time for Amazon Music and okay. Netflix. Um, and because the community is so small, you actually get to know colorists um, over the whole spectrum of um, from starting out to a uh, super professional. Um, I'm friends on Facebook with a colorist called Walter Volpato and he, he color graded Star Wars, Dunkirk, Hateful wow. Eight, Tarantino. Um, and one of the jobs that I got during lockdown was uh, a film that I had previously created for a client. He'd, um, it did really well at Fright Fest in London, the yeah. film festival, and then he sold it to a distributor in Los Angeles. And the distributor wanted me to uh, create what's called a digital cinema package. Um, dig digital cinema package is essentially what you send a, um, a cinema a theater if when they want to project you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the footage, when they want to play the movie in, inside the cinema. Um, so I had to do that for, for LA, um, which was quite a technical challenge because um, normally when we send DCPs off to festivals, we just create them, we use the normal specs and that kind of thing, and then we send it off and it's fine. But because this distributor wanted to be able to uh, dub this film in other languages and have um, subtitles in other languages and all that kind of thing, we had to send it through a, a QA process, quality assessment. And um, that went through QA and come, came back, and then we had to create a 5.1 surround track for it, um, which I got involved with as well. Because in the, in the coloring world, there are two types of colorists. There are colorists that just color. So we get the footage from the editor, we color it, we send it back to the editor, and they then go and assemble the film and the sound and all that kind of stuff and they create the final okay. deliverable okay. Um, but i sometimes also do that second step which is called finishing so i'll get the film i'll color grade it and then i'll receive the sound from the sound editor um, i'll get any vfx if there was a vfx company involved and um and i'll create the final deliverables for whatever they want to wherever they want to send this film, if it's uh, festivals or online or, okay. um, or broadcast, um, yeah. which is a completely different animal. But, uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, lockdown just meant... I'm really surprised that, that, that there's not many people that do, that are colorists. 
that's quite shocking actually in this country it's yeah it's a, it's a it's a it's a difficult one to master it really yeah. is because because there's no training for it um the online training is or, you know people will normally go on youtube videos and they they'll see things like oh you want to make make your film look brilliant then i'm the, the youtuber will go i'm selling this lot over here you just slap on that on your footage and everything will be okay but that actually is not true yeah at all. <laughs> <Of course>. <laughs> <laughs> um, um how did you uh how did you or when did you develop a film uh, a passion sorry for for films um like when you were a kid for instance from birth yeah um i started watching films on vhs when i before i could walk um yeah it, it's just always been a passion and um i don't think it's one that will ever go away um, what films were your favourite when you were growing up? Or what films stood up, stay, stand up most in your brain from when you were a kid or a teenager? I had quite a wide range of of, um, of tastes. Uh, everything from the old, uh, you know, kung fu movies with Jackie Chan. Um, I love those films. <laughs> really enjoy those. Um, I can remember a film called Highlander. <laughs> My friend Tom still... loves that film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he um, loves that film. <laughs> and uh, horror films. I watched a lot of horror when I was a kid. Maybe it's because you weren't supposed to, but um, back then we didn't have such strict age controls. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, Friday the 13th and Halloween, I watched that before I was 10. Um, <laughs> I spoke to another probably... filmmaker. Uh, he's on one of the episodes earlier. Um, Odin. He said that he watched The Exorcist when he was like nine or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, he went running to his dad, screaming, goes, ah! <laughs> and he would wake up in the middle of the night, scream. <laughs> yeah. His dad had to say, "No, it's all right. It's not real." Blah, blah, blah. And then he was fine watching him like why would you watch the exorcist at nine years old <laughs> I, I remember watching halloween with my dad around that age yeah yeah <laughs> did you really <laughs> yeah. yeah uh so funny I, um i think uh, i told my friend that, um my uncle once took my cousins to see friday the 13th when they were probably like i don't know nine and eleven or something so it's like yeah. having like a, a father's and son's day out or something so yeah it seems to be uh it's funny that um a lot of men i know they all have sort of similar stories about when they were younger and went to see those yeah. horror films by themselves or stayed at home and watched them when they shouldn't have so that's really funny any other ones that stood out to you or that you enjoyed when you were growing up um Did you I like the know. westerns i know that's way before your time but like the spaghetti westerns i never there saw there was one western with two guys they were very much like a laurel and hardy pair they oh, called okay. um terence hill and bud spencer okay and it was italian translated into american english okay. um but it was very much comedic it wasn't serious mm. yeah. So I, I remember watching that quite a lot um, when, when, I, when I was a kid. But um, I think from my school onwards, um, nothing really stood out uh, until I developed my passion for film again, you know, now in later life. Okay. Um, and, and now it's, it's pretty much everything that's got a good story. Um, I, I love... Uh, there's a channel that you can sign up to called Movie, mm -hmm. where they've got uh, a selection of film that's a selection of films that's really more about storytelling and less about special effects. Um, okay, which I absolutely loved. It was brilliant. It's a shame there's too many films now that rely only on special effects, isn't it? I mean, there's very few that have the art of actually telling a, a good story. Which is yeah. kind of sad, really. Yeah, they they are um, they are more especially mainstream cinema. Yeah, they're few and further between. I mean, mm. um, something recently was uh, a film called Phantom Thread, 
Okay. Um, quite enjoy okay. that. Um, there was one called the. I'm going to have to get this right. Guernsey Potato Peel Society, something okay. in the Potato Peel Society, which was <laughs> which was quite good. Um, I like anything with a vintage look because I'm a colorist and you know, it's a different kind of look. And then um, uh, Grand Budapest Hotel, Wes Anderson films. I do like them because it's a very distinct look that he puts on his films. Yeah, it's funny that, um, isn't it? Can you can you explain that look? Because I remember we, uh, during one of the lockdowns last year, um, I think it was the one that was from like after Christmas till March, um, I suggested with my family that we do a weekly film club. So we take it in turns. We picked out a piece of paper with someone's name on it and they had to choose a film for everyone to watch. And then that weekend following, we would have to discuss it and give our thoughts. And we watched one of them. It's one of his older ones with Bill Murray. Um, sent, sent something. Oh, God, I can't even remember. Uh, with a boy and Bill Murray. It's, it's I think it's one of his much older films. Right. Um, I don't know if that rings a bell. But um yeah, I don't know what it is about his films. I I like the The Life Aquatic. Yeah. I really love that film because I like the colours. Uh and it's kind so of there's like a few quirky. things that he does. Um he, he definitely in in the in the pre-production he will he will spend um a lot of time planning the look and uh a, a lot of his especially in grand budapest a lot a lot of the scenes have a specific color tone that dominates the entire frame. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um and he'll also he, he's a he's an extreme stickler for symmetry and getting angles absolutely perfect Oh um, yeah, you can see that, can't you? And is in yeah. a lot of his films. Yeah, and a, a lot of his films are a lot of his shot scenes are straight on, where there's no depth, and you've got a balance like two people on of equal size on both sides, and then one like smaller one in the middle, or um, uh, you'll have extreme depth, which is the which is the opposite. Um, mm. I think within the foyer of the hotel, you had this. The, the the little um, bellboy running from really far away up into where they are, and when yeah. he stops, the frame balanced itself. He's a he's a, he's a perfectionist when it comes to um, to, to doing that cinematography. Yeah. Um, um, I was going to ask you if you. So I'm trying to figure out how to to put this. <laughs> so basically, if it wasn't one of his films, but he worked on another one. Um, so he wasn't well known for that one, and he wasn't mentioned for the cinematography side. So, say for instance, in this case, he was used as a cinematographer, or um, mm. well, I guess what would he be? Uh, the the cinematographer? Yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? I guess. Um, and he wasn't mentioned at all in the. Yeah. Po- would you be able to? click onto that right away and think, ah, this is Wes Anderson's work. Do you know what I mean? Even though it's yes. not his work, it's not him directing yeah. it. But would you be able yeah. to tell right away visually that there's like, this reminds me of something. I don't know. And you think anything, oh, it's Wes Anderson. Would you would you um, catch on to that is what I'm trying to ask you. Yeah, 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 definitely. Because yeah. Um, because of it, the way that he frames a, a shot, also because of the way that he blocks um, which you can see in uh, another movie of his called Moonrise Kingdom. Mm-hmm. Um, he has the specific way of having people move through a scene where it goes from left to right and you're following the person walking and then they'll stop and then they'll like turn around the other way. It is so um, specific and perfectionist that you can... If, if you watch a film, you, you'll instantly see, oh, well, yeah, that's his style. He's, yeah, he's yeah. got a sig- signature style. Yeah. Um, do you think that works for a lot of directors as well? Could you tell with them, for instance, right away? Or do you think that now a lot of filmmakers tend to be, mm, they, they, they try to be a bit more, what's the word, um, eclectic? Generalist. Yeah. No, no, no. They try and, they try and 
make things look different every time and switch it up? Or do you oh, right, right, right. That makes sense? Um, do you think a lot of them yeah. stay with what's... Like, for instance, Tarantino has very much his own style and signature. Yes. Um, yeah. uh, Wes Anderson has. So do you think that they tend to sort of and develop that over time and then they think, actually, this is working for me, this is what I like, so they stick with it? Do you think that's what they tend to do? Um, I, I think it might be that. I think it also might be that um, they do some, something, they apply a, sty a style in a film and then that gets seen and another client will come to them and say, I'd like you to do what you've done on that film, on my film. Okay. Slightly different, so it's not a direct copy, but sure. I, 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 like this, I like what you've done. And I get it, that, that is a colorist as well. Um, uh, I created this one um, short film called uh, Into Nirvana, and it, uh, it had a very specific look to it. Um, and I got another client contacting me. Um, she's from London, um, but she also lives and works in India. Um, and she said that I saw Into Nirvana, and I, I visited this film, and I'd very much like you to do my film because I liked what you did on Enter the Barn. So I think it'll be very much like that for DPs as well, where they'll be called by a prospective client and saying, I like what you've done on that film. Um, and it's very much what the, it's very much what I have in mind for my film. Because mm. um, it's very difficult to, um, to visualize what an entire film is going to look like in your head, yeah, uh, with, without pulling in some references, and and we do that all the time. I use a site called Shot Deck, and Shot Deck is essentially just stills from other movies, and then I'll use frames from you know many different movies, and I'll put them into a little collection and say, "There's a look that could represent your film." That. That's an example of how a colorist can get involved. Okay, in, there's a bit like references, I guess, because I mean a yeah, lot. Of, so, like the references. Yeah, 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 a lot of them. Uh, like, I mean, Tarantino is well known for for using a lot of visual references yeah. to old films, isn't he? So, so I guess yeah. yeah, that would make sense to to give, um, for instance, like you said, to show a potential client. You know, maybe this could work for you. So they might you might do a bit of this, and they might do an image of yeah. this so to give it a kind yeah, of. Yeah. A kind of a, actually, I've got a good question for you. Do you know the filmmaker um, Tom Ford? Uh, I, yes, I know the name. Yeah. Well, actually, he's a fashion designer, but he has right. done uh, so. He's a famous fashion designer, but he has done a few, a couple or so films, um, and the color is absolutely amazing. Um, so the first film I saw of him, I've never seen the other ones. I think he's only got about two more two other ones and and that's it mm. but um he did one the first one he did was a single man with Colin Firth and um what's the name Juliana Moore um it's like 2010 or something like that so making a note yeah give a look it up look it up <laughs> but, but the the colors are amazing and actually I think it works so well because he's obviously from a fashion background and yeah. has to deal with textiles and colors yeah. and materials and you can see that kind of right away um how much of uh, an impact that's had on his you know on his uh on the way he sees things and it's it's quite yeah. interesting to see like you said someone come from more of an artistic background you think actually you can transfer from one thing to another thing do you know what I mean yeah. so so, yeah. so you think, why would it be so surprising to have a fashion designer suddenly do something and make a film? Do you know, because yeah. actually it could work, like you said, because you went from being a photographer uh, into doing being a colorist. So, um, so yeah, I don't know. Have you ever seen any of his films? Uh, I might have done. I, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I've seen a, a million films. Um, I'll, <laughs> I'll have a look in any case. Um, yeah, yeah, you should. Yeah, that, that, the name does classic. ring a bell. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, A Single Man. Yeah, I'll yeah. have a look at that. Yeah. It came out a while ago, because um, I <laughs> I worked at a cinema in 2010 for like a few months before I sorted myself out and became a swimming teacher and an actor on the side, etc. Um, but um, 
and uh, and I saw that film and I remember thinking it was just visually very striking um mm. uh, you know he really pays attention with like the close-ups on the colors the clothes the dresses um so it's just very interesting because like I said he's obviously from a background where he studied um you know fashion so he's had to know about materials yeah. and yeah, yeah. um I don't know well, exactly what fashion entails because I never studied it but you know what I mean so it would yeah. involve that so I, I was just wondering if you if, if you ever came across any of his work because he's kind of like you said he's got his own style as well his own signature um yeah. so, so that's very I, you know. I I actually love um working for clients that have that kind of um knack or background um that example that I gave of Enter Nirvana the um the writer producer producer of that um uh, her name is Lindsay Bennett Thompson. Okay. She gave me a, a brilliant mood board for the film. It mm. was just a PDF document with all kinds of references and colors and everything that I needed to be able to see what's in her head and then apply a grade that would fit the film. Um, so anytime I come across a client that gives me just you know, an explosion of documentation and references and everything. It's like, oh, goody, because <laughs> the opposite of that is um, somebody gives me nothing and I've got nothing to work off. Um, yeah. Yeah. But and uh, normally what I do then is I, I'll, I'll take like one clip from every scene and I'll take, bring those clips together and I'll call them the master, master set. And I'll apply a look to just those clips and I'll send it back and say, and I'll, that, that'll take me like an hour or something. I'll, I'll, I'll send it back and go, is this a good look for, for your film? Yeah. Is this what you had in mind? And sometimes they'll come back and go, oh, that looks fabulous. And sometimes they'll come back and say, that is not at all what I had in mind for my film. I was like, okay, great. Now <laughs> we've started the conversation. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, for instance, because you're saying at the beginning, you guys are... <laughs> I like the drummer in the band. You're locked away for months and months and months. So how long usually, I mean, I know it depends on the project and it's kind of like saying how long is a piece of string, but roughly how long would it take you to do colouring on anything? I know it varies on the okay. length, et cetera, but uh, can you try and give sort of rough estimate? I know it varies. Yeah, yeah, length. sure. So for a, um, a short film, which is between 12 and 15 minutes long, um, sometimes they are forced to shorten it below 10 minutes, depending on the festival they want to submit to. Yeah, but yeah. That, that'll usually take about two to three days. Okay. Um, there's normally quite a lot of time spent in just transferring footage because the, the footage that I have to grade off is quite big. Um, Sometimes I can, it can be transferred online and sometimes it's actually too big and we have to send it on a little external hard drive through the post, you know, okay. special delivery. Um, and, um, uh, and the other part of the time that's taken is just the client approving and making changes um, until we've got the thing out of the door. But it's normally about three days for short. Okay. Uh, Feature film, hour and 40 minutes, um, that could be anywhere between three weeks and four months. Okay. It just depends on the complexity. Okay. Um, if uh, there's, a, there's a big difference in between coloring a feature film where the story plays off in inside a house and just the rooms inside the house um, and a feature film that plays off, uh, you know, inside outdoors at five different locations with one scene in a helicopter and the other one underground that's 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 a vastly different type of film yeah. it's a lot more complex as well, especially when vfx comes into play because sure. then the vfx elements have to come in and they have to be uh matched in with the shot footage okay so, for instance, um, here's an interesting question for you. So, in a short film or film situation, who would your boss be? Would it be the director or would it be the editor? 
So, I mean, like, it's who would you huge. report to usually? Does that make sense? So, if you say, okay, I'm done, what's it? <laughs> or, 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 like, do you want to check yeah. who, who goes to who, basically? I'm assuming because you send it off to the editor. So, would they be kind of like your boss, or would the, would the director or the DP be a boss, if that makes sense? Or would none of them be a boss? <laughs> it's, it's usually the um, director. Right. Um, it depends on how many hands are in the pot in terms of production and that kind of thing. Uh, it's usually the director. Um, there are times when it could be the editor. Okay. When, it, when, when, it's, um, when, when, when we're doing what we call a round trip, where it goes from editor to colors, then back to editor. Um, then it could be the editor. But then the decision for the look of the film normally falls with the per person that's creating the film and not the person that's yeah. editing the film. Um, so um, I would think that even if I would do round trip with the editor, the director or the producer would be looking at it and, and, and signing it off. Okay. And for, especially during COVID, um, the jobs are all remote. Um, so, you know, I received the footage and I read it and I send it off and it's, uh, there's no face to face. But um, in the past and probably in the future, now that we're out of lockdown, um, I could either be working remotely or I could be doing um, the final finishing day uh, where we go to a, a grading studio. And it's just one opened up in, in, in Sheffield recently, but okay. um, I used to use once in London. Um, where we go to a grading studio and we all sit inside this um, like mini theatre really with a grading desk at the back and they w essentially watch the film and then as they give comments on screen I make the changes oh, to okay. the film so it's, a, it's like a live grade um, that can also be done remotely um, I could uh, I have in the past uh, either done over a zoom call where I share my screen while I'm grading and then they make changes as we go along. Okay. Um, most recently for a client in London, he does uh, documentaries. Um, and we're busy with a series at the moment. Okay. And uh, we, we, we would do a Zoom and he would run through the film and um, make changes as we go. Okay. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of a change changed world after COVID. So yeah. I don't know how much of the in-house um, grading I'm going to be doing going forward. It might so are you still working from remote. home? Or are you, I mean, for one for a period of time, were you allowed to go in, in the office, for instance? And then, I mean, I'd imagine during the lockdowns, you obviously had to stay at home and work from home. Um, yeah. But then are you still um, basically pretty much working from home or do you are you allowed to every now and then? go and use the facilities somewhere else like you said because you're in Sheffield so there's a place so it's, it's it's mostly from home I've turned okay. a, a room in my house into a grading studio okay. um and um I do have the opportunity to go into the office uh but I don't really see clients at the moment because yeah. of you know, the COVID thing so yeah. there's never really any reason for me to go into the office okay um so it's mostly remote remote grading that's, that's you'd happening. have to be very patient doing your job wouldn't you <laughs> yeah I, 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 I was blessed with patience i think i see uh, i'm not a patient person so I <laughs> you. <laughs> i'd be getting really annoyed and yeah no i yeah. remember when i um when we were in college and doing our our um you know film practical assignments and stuff like that and editing oh, just hours in there in the digital editing suite and I used to do yeah and sometimes we we used to have I don't know if you if you know this but this was like in the 90s so they've probably stopped this but maybe some people still use it they used to have so they had two digital editing suites and obviously bear in mind this is in the 90s and I think we were using um I think we were using prem Premiere or Premier, yeah. I can't remember one of them. So there were only two suites and they were quite new. So we had to book all the equipment out because there were a lot of us. Um so sometimes we couldn't 
and we'd have to use those I don't know if you know those ones the the analog ones so you'd have like three screens uh, yeah. and this is how old I am you put a tape <laughs> oh yeah yeah <laughs> you put yeah. a video yeah. in and then you yeah. put the one and then you put the one that you want to edit on to it and you have the two yeah. screens where you're yeah, yeah. it's a telecine machine isn't it what what was it called it, yeah there's like Tele- and you're yeah, basically tel- yeah, you play. Uh, I you think play it's called the telecine. Yeah, you play from the original vid- uh, footage, and yeah. then the, uh, onto the video that you want to do. You you find that footage that's copied onto it, and I can't remember. It was too too much. But but I used to get really annoyed doing that. <laughs> I was just <laughs> was so annoying. I was just like, do I have to be here? Do I have to do this? I was like 16, 17. I was like, oh, I could be doing so many better things, right? <laughs> so I so think... I really, I really, really respect people that, that do your job and post editing yeah. because I think you'd have to have the patience of God knows. <laughs> I think it takes a certain personality. Um, you have to have patience. And I think you also, I don't think any of us are um, particularly social people because you spend so many hours yeah. on your own. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, but I think COVID is, and I, I, I'm probably not a very social person. I'm probably a bit of an introvert, but I think COVID has even... Uh, uh, pushed me a bit in terms of the isolation because I decided recently I'm going to start a YouTube channel because I think I just wanted a little bit more, you know, social contact or yeah, 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 yeah. people commenting or whatever. Yeah, because yeah. Um, as a uh, with, with the whole color grading thing, um, most of my work is under NDA, so I can't speak to anybody about it. Um, and even after I've done it, um, the film then goes into festivals and that's on the contract and everything so i can't share any visuals from that so yeah. it's very difficult to feed the social media monster because i can't feed it with anything and it's also really difficult to speak to other people that do my job because there aren't many yeah <laughs> do you not yeah. get um invited to say the premieres or anything because obviously it is your work involved in it too yeah i have done yeah have you? um and um, unfortunately, d- during COVID, I couldn't I couldn't go. Um, but yeah, I know I have done I, that. That is really nice, you know, going to going to a premiere and seeing everybody that was um, yeah involved and acknowledging yeah. your work as well, which is also yeah. important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. I think there's also the bit where I'm sitting in the cinema and I'm I'm watching it, and for the first time, I'm seeing something and I think. I could have done that better. Oh, I was going to say, yeah, this is the thing. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this is the thing. Yeah. And also, it's the same if you're an actor. You're like, you know, you hear how actors hate watching themselves. And I'm also the same. You're like, oh, I know. I really wish I didn't do that. I could have done that better. <laughs> so I would be like, <laughs> so I was going to ask you that, which is funny because you said that the same. So would you Definitely. preferably try not to go and watch your work after you've done the finished project? Uh, no, I'm. I'm too curious. I, oh, really? I, I, I would still go. Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't feel so bad because um, you know, I, I watch series and films um, on Netflix, and I spot problems there. I've, spot, I, I've spotted covering problems. Too, on, I was going to ask, do you do that? Because obviously, with your background, I, do you I say can't not like, see it? Really? Yeah, I can't not see it. it, it <laughs> my, my wife has a rule that when we're watching a film, I'm not allowed to talk about <laughs> color grading until the film is finished. <laughs> That's so funny because the thing is, because you're talking about that, I remember when we had to study film theory for two years and then we got drummed into our head, and I've said this many, many times in the other episodes about mise en scène and yeah. narrative. So it's always mise en scène because, like, and also, I guess your job has a lot to do with the mise en scène as well because that's yeah. the, the, the tone of the film. Um, and um, it, when you studied it, then you kind of know what to look out for or what's going to happen. And I'll be watching the film going, oh, I think this is going to happen. And I'm like, my friend, just like, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Stop talking. <laughs> so... So I've learned to kind of switch it off. But I can understand it must be exactly the same. <laughs> yeah. It's the same for you. That must be so funny, your poor wife. 
I've spotted stuff from from the Crown to Star really? Wars to Marvel films, and um, yeah, I've just learned to bite my tongue. <laughs> but also, I was going to say, I guess your job has a lot to do with continuity as well, doesn't it? Yeah, bit, like you yeah. said, because you the colours, so so Actually, yeah. yeah, yeah, to make sure yeah. it matches exactly. Yeah, and 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 that's one of the things that I spot where you'll have uh, turnarounds. You know, where the one acts as piece and the other one acts piece and the other one's piece, and um, they they'll have two cameras on them where you you'll be seeing a close up of the one actor, and then when the other one responds, you're close up on them. And so what I notice is on the one actor, I'm seeing the frame, skin tone, everything goes to the other actor, comes back, and is different. And my eyes pick that up and go, the colors didn't match these. Well, what were they <laughs> thinking? <laughs> it's, you, you I don't know if it's a Find blessing anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Find their name on the on the on the credits email. <laughs> They're probably doing like you. They probably do like you. Troll <laughs> them, yeah. Yeah, after they watch it, go, oh no, why did they do no. that? <laughs> I've got a deadline to reach. <laughs> Well, that's the thing. I think a lot of the um, the, the, the shows that hit Netflix, um, whatever colorist errors I spot, were because of their deadlines. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sure they work under some serious deadlines. Well, actually, it's funny because I remember talking to my mum and my stepdad about this um, during when when COVID first came out. Um, obviously, everything was closed. Cinemas were closed, and then then it was this kind of new stuff that, that was put on Netflix, they they did mention that they'd seen a couple of films where the sound was really not that good. Um, and mm. it kind of felt like it had been rushed, which actually you can kind of understand because if that was made initially to come out in a cinema or um, was going, going to go on longer production-wise and then yeah. released later much later on netflix and then suddenly this has happened and everyone's at home and bored out their minds um then you could, could kind of see that actually we're gonna rush and put this all out now um yeah, yeah. so 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 i'm sure that happened for even things like sound and you know a lot of, yeah. a lot of things so did yeah. you, would you be able to identify i mean not you directly but then would you be able to see that actually in a lot of the stuff that came out on netflix sometimes they might have rushed it, possibly because they have a strict deadline to yeah yeah um i i see that on on on, on series um more than i do on on features because i think on features they've got they've got more time okay i'm sure they're also under uh, under a rush by whoever is holding the post to get the thing out the door sure, sure. but um i think just generally they have more time than they would do on series um yeah. because uh netflix is a hungry monster and you have to keep feeding it really um, if it, yeah if you think about um the not so much the number of series that come out but how quickly you have to follow one series coming out and becoming popular and everybody's watching it or like um, a turnover. When, when, yeah. when that when that finishes when that last episode of that series goes up there has to be another series to take its place and to pick up the attention of the masses that makes else people sense. are going to yeah. walk away from netflix and go and watch amazon prime and Disney sure. plus so there's that pressure for them to always have that content coming in one after yeah. the other i think that's really interesting um, I've never it from, from that from yeah that and if you think that, that um, if they if they show a new um, episode every week, every Friday or whatever, then um, and you've got ten episodes in series. That's only ten weeks to to shoot another series in ten weeks. That's a really tight deadline. Yeah, and also they would yeah. lose their members, and then they would lose more money, wouldn't they? Because obviously yeah. they're they're. I mean, they've been very good like that because you know there's um, a certain. Uh, subscription pay and mark which is very um you know feasible but then yeah. like you said it's kind of like a vicious circle i guess you know you've got to, like it is like a hungry monster literally you've got to feed yeah. it to make sure people yeah, yeah. start wandering away and going somewhere else so there was one question i wanted to ask you can you give a few examples of your favorite films that use your favorite um i guess color tones or you know that you really that stand up the most color wise what are your favorite films that's it. Okay. Color tone. 
that really um, instinctively sort of stay in your yeah. mind? Yeah, so I, I mentioned about Joker. That was that was very yeah, much a, a, a masterpiece in terms of color grading. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, a film that has a well, films that have very specific looks would be something like the Wes Anderson Moonrise Moonrise Kingdom and the Grand Budapest Hotel. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a fan of um, Christopher Nolan's films. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the color grade, uh, specifically Don Kirk, I think he did a very good job on Don Kirk. Um, and then on Mubi, uh, these are films probably that aren't as well known. There's one called Beanpole. Oh, okay. Um, it's a it's a Russian film. I think it's subtitled, um, but the colors on it are just. Fabulous! It, it's in the it's in the category or uh, as good as Joker, okay. um, where the colors just yeah the oh, colors just okay. jump off the screen. It's such a beautiful film. Uh, and then um, I, I think I mentioned about Phantom Thread. That would also be one where the coloring was was very well done. And um, some of the David Fincher films as well um like fight club. Uh, fight club yeah that was that, that was very well done especially the night scenes night scenes are very difficult actually oh um, really can you explain <clears throat> so digital digital cameras don't really like um filming in darkness okay. and the reason for that is that when it's really dark, there isn't a lot of light hitting the sensor, but what you then see instead of just pure black is you see digital noise. And all that noise is, is uh, essentially the um, electric current flowing through the sensor. Okay. You didn't get this in the film days because it was film. There was no electricity flowing through the film. Um, so, um, so whatever you're filming, well, whenever I get involved in pre-production and we're going to be making a film that is shot at night, um, I would create a show lot, as I mentioned. But what I would do is I would adjust it so that it forces the, uh, the cinematographer to actually shoot the scene much lighter than they would. Because normally what they'll do is they'll film it like they want it to look in the movie right but in fact it's better to film it a, a bit brighter and then in the um grade i could bring it down make it darker again because if you if you film it brighter then you're not going to get as much um uh, noise in the in the in the shadows okay so put more light on it, make it dark, make it brighter, and then in the grade I can darken it down again, as long as your color contrast ratios yeah. are fine. Um, because digital sensors don't don't like darkness. Um, okay. uh, they like uh, you know a, a good amount of light. Um, and um, so, what was my point? Uh, uh -huh. so you're saying um, you, you also like David Fincher films. So we mentioned. Uh, Fight Club. Oh yes, yes. Sorry, yes. Uh, and and Fight Fight Club is really well done um, because the the darker scenes were really well controlled right. in terms of look. Um, and and have... some of the productions um, like The Crown. I even though I mentioned The Crown in terms of I saw some colorist errors. Um, I I do love the look of The Crown. Um, okay. And there was another series also Victoria. That came out. Okay, um, that was also very well done. Uh, so every once in a while, there'd be a film, and I think it was like, "Wow, colorist really did." Yeah, really yeah, great work. Yeah, um, you can see it wasn't just a look from another film that was slapped onto that one. Yeah, yeah, there wasn't care taken. In. And I also love it when a film where the color is used to support the emotion. Like um, a film will normally have an emotional transition built into the story. Like, you know, um, Jane Doe is happy in her life and then something happens and 
changes everything and there's drama and everything. And if the color can support that that transition through the story where in the beginning of the story, everything's bright and airy and sunshine and warm and happy. And after the incident that happened, um, it goes you know, maybe dark and, and cold. Uh, there's a okay. bit of green in the shadows and stuff like that. You know, whenever I see that in a film, that's that's my favorite because um, it's like, yes, you, you you're doing this right because at the end of the day, color grading is all about supporting the emotion in a film. Okay. Um, and that's when you when I see online when somebody says. I've got this grade here and they show three clips and they think, what do you think it would? And I'm like, I've got no idea because I don't know what story is behind it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but anyways, yeah. Um, actually, I was going to ask you, because you were talking about that. So, and it came to my mind, you know, those films that, for instance, are filmed like a film and the and then what happens is they draw on top of them. So, I mean, I'll give some examples like a scanner, so a scanner dark. Did you ever see that one? Um, yeah. So they use the actual actors, and then I think they had these sensors over them, and then they put it on to, and then they animate over. So it has a very unusual look to it. Yeah. Would they also go to a colorist afterwards, or would they actually do it themselves because they're in charge of the animation? If that makes sense. Um, they, I, if they are any kind of like professional production, they would also use a colorist. Um, okay. And I've actually got a, a client that phoned me last week um, they creating what's called a rotoscope film um, okay. so that's essentially rotoscoping when you when you trace the outline of the footage and you create a more of an animated look oh it. okay so it's kind of the um, same thing yeah, yeah yeah so they use um, the actors and then they put it on to a sort of uh i don't know how it works i mean it's very it, it's, it's amazing to watch it's kind of like yeah they animate on top of it so yeah, yes. Yeah, it's got a very. Is Sin City the same kind of look, or or is, yeah, yes, was yeah. that the same? Um, it's it's probably not exactly the same as no. Ken Darkly, but it it's like a um, no, no, sorry, Sin City. It, sorry, it's also a, yeah, it's a, it's also a creative look that was applied over footage. It's okay. the same approach. Yeah. Okay. Oh, for Ken kind of Dark, not not Sin City. Well, between the scanner dark and Sun City, they oh, okay. have the same approach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But not the same look. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? There haven't been many films since that seem to have done have that kind I think of it's, work anymore. It's a lot of work, and it's yeah. difficult to, to to get it to look really good. Yeah. Um, um, and when when you do it really well, it it works really well, and it makes a lot of noise um, like as Canada Dark and Sin City are very well known yeah because of their look but it's difficult to get right must be and right. that's why that that's why I would suspect that they they would have used the colors because even if you're animating um you could still make errors in um, in matching um, okay. and then when people watch watch the film you could have continuity of tone problems so okay. yeah Okay. Yeah. No, it's very, it's really, and I guess that would take a lot one, longer, a lot longer to work on as well in comparison yeah. to doing a normal, say, yeah. film, for instance. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it would, because the human eye is very good at spotting problems um, when there's less complexity. Like if I showed you a painting that's got red and white on it, if, you had the, if I then showed you a painting that was, a slightly more orange version of red and white, you'd, you'd, you'd see them instantly. Yeah. Whereas if it was like a Jackson Pollock painting, there's just a bunch of scribbles and stuff. <laughs> I show you one of those, and then another one of those, you go, mm, yeah, I guess it's the same. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. There's so much chaos you can't, you can't yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's been really interesting talking to you. No, I genuinely have enjoyed talking yeah. to you. I could talk Thank great. you very much. Um, is there anything you want to say? I mean, you're more than welcome to come back anytime and do a theme show. So, I mean, have a think if you want to do that, if you're going to come back and do, I don't know, your favourite cinematography or it could be absolutely anything film-related, then you're more than welcome to come back and do like um, 
a special follow up because I've done that. Yeah, we can definitely do. I, I'll have a think about a, a theme that would be interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's something that you feel passionate about, though, that, that yeah. you want to talk about. So, yeah, otherwise, yeah. you know, because that's you know, it's good conversation and it's what you genuinely enjoy um, talking about and, and watching. So, no, it's been an absolute pleasure. No, I'd really, really enjoy talking to you because they really, haven't really spoken too. to anyone actually who's, I mean, I've spoken to filmmakers, so they're kind of on the technical side, but I yeah. haven't spoken to any editors or anyone that's involved in, you know, the sort of the ones that are locked away in the, in the, in, in the dark cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> like you said so the cave it, trolls <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, the, yeah exactly the people in the dark but nobody sees <laughs> so so i think you've given them a, a voice <laughs> brilliant done my bit yeah. yeah so no it'd be it'd be lovely to have you back again so um yeah no have a think if you want to come back anytime you want just give me a shout okay brilliant. all right so it's been lovely talking right. to you Heinz. Have a lovely evening. All right, you too. <laughs> Take Enjoy. care. Bye. Bye.